uh, hello, RacketCon. Uh, you guys can hear the slides and hear me all right? Well, can you see the slides, though? Say again? Faded. It could be the lighting issue, to be honest. Uh, let's see. Is that better? All right, I didn't plan to, to do this in the in light theme, but let's see how it goes, yeah? All right. So Fast CGI is, the protocol is where we're going to begin because that's where sort of it began for me. Um, this talk, however, is not at all about Fast CGI, the protocol. Um, I'm just uh, setting up a stage a little bit. Uh, so this is the problem that I intended to solve. Uh, it was also a bit of an exercise, right? I, I would come back and forth between Racket and other languages, uh, but it would never sort of stick. I would implement a bunch of macros, maybe some little languages, but it remained more of a toy. Um, <clears throat> as it often happens, the path to implementing this uh, turned out to be quite a bit more interesting and maybe more exciting and worth talking about than the final destination. Uh, in the process, I ended up implementing and using a bunch of languages, um, and that talk is mostly about that. Um, so uh, do people actually know what CGI and fast CGI do? And for, okay. <laughs> Are there people who do not know? Okay, so CGI and fast CGI, um, they're just protocols that we, so they, mm, that we uh, tried using back in the 90s to do dynamic web programming. So the idea is actually quite simple. Um, the request comes in, your, the web server, uh, probably Apache at the time, maps it onto the file system, finds a script there, runs the script, and whatever that script ends up spitting out into the standard output is sent back to the client, yeah? So as you can imagine, that involves quite a bit of overhead. So in an attempt to remedy this, uh, they came up with this um, fairly small extension to the protocol uh, called Fast CGI. It's not the most, uh, it's not the best protocol out there, uh, but it sort of worked. Uh, your program remains in memory, right? And it just talks over TCP IP. It talks uh, through the TCP socket. That's the idea. Um, because I'm setting up the stage here a little bit, I'll just go quickly through this. It's not a terribly uh, complex spec, it's not big. It only defines a handful of messages and the particulars are not important, but it's just all of them right there and some of them are not very useful. Um, it is a binary protocol, so you have to parse and pack those bytes, right? That gets a little annoying, that's why I'm saying it's not the best of protocols for that type of thing. Um, and some messages are multi-part, so you have to receive them all, assemble, to gather the payload. Uh, and like I said, so this is a pseudo C struct to show you that it is actually a sequence of bytes that you need to parse. This is a fast CGI header. So you take it off the wire, uh, and at the minimum, you need to get at the, so at the type of the record coming in or the message uh, coming in, maybe the length of the payload, the padding, that kind, of, that kind of stuff. It's nothing too complex, but it's a little annoying. And it gets a little more involved when you get to deal with uh, parameters of the request. Those are just name value pairs. And the reason for that is because they, they prepend the lengths of the name and the, and, and the value in the message in the front, and those can be one of four bytes. So you need to, dis you figure which, which it is by looking at the most significant bit. So not terribly complex, but still annoying. And that's a typical message flow, right? You receive a begin request, followed by a multi-part message with parameters, and then maybe some input, your application runs, does its job, and re replies with a response, uh, and then ends the request. So that's the idea. Because we're fighting overhead here, uh, they decided that they would multiplex things, and uh, the spec itself is very general. So you can multiplex requests, many requests on a single connection, no matter how hard I try, well, actually, I didn't try that hard, but I couldn't convince Nginx to, to do this, right? It's not as general. It decided, I'm gonna open a new connection for every request, which is reasonable. Um, thing is, uh, concurrency model in Racket, being what it is, is actually quite flexible, to the point that we're implementing the most general multiplexing strategy turns out to be not much more complex than the, the simple one. 
And we may as well do that, and I ended up doing exactly that. All right, so let's dispense with those bits and bytes very quickly. So how would a professional do that? So you end up writing code like this. Don't bother reading it. It's just to give you the shape of the code. I'm basically channeling C here. So you bit shifting, masking, adding, oring, soaring, that sort of thing. Uh, is that pleasant? This is, by the way, me parsing fuzzy J header just to prove the point, right? All right, how about those name value pairs? It gets, it's path dependent, so it gets more involved. And that code has no error checking whatsoever. None of it, right? Is that a good idea for a binary protocol that talks on the wire? Maybe not. Um, okay, we, we've done that. Uh, no error checking, okay, we can sprinkle a little later. We are professionals. Uh, <laughs> Thing is, you need to reply, right? Don't forget to pack those bytes. We're not even done. So this is a, not a terribly difficult protocol, but imagine a more involved kind of thing that you have to do. That becomes really annoying very quickly. There must be a better way. What we're dealing with is basically bit patterns, byte patterns. So we know how to deal with those in Racket, right? Pattern matching. So can we do better? Yeah. Lucky for me, and hopefully for you, <laughs> Tony Garner Jones looked around and found just such DSL in Erlang. Unsurprisingly, like those people leave on the wire. So he brought it to Racket in the form of this wonderful little library, maybe not so little actually, uh, bit syntax. I'm glad I didn't have to write that. Um, it's, it's really hairy, hairy but it's, it's an amazing little library because it lets you use the same patterns pretty much, both for parsing and packing. And it is extensible in the same, so like Matthias, for those of you who attended summer school and was present yesterday, Matthias mentioned, right, the whole languages and then embedded languages. This one is, uh, can be extended in the same manner as you would extend uh, record match or syntax parse. More or less the same idea. And it's really, really good. That's all it takes to, that's all it takes to parse FCGI header. How about that? And pack. That second example down at the bottom, me packing. Do I have to explain how this works? You can probably just read it and understand what's going on. Uh, name value pairs, parameters, not much more complex, right? The only thing that stands out, uh, FCGI length there, obviously not part of the language. This is my extension to the language, right? All it took is a small macro, but the essence of that macro is actually in those two patterns. Is, I'm just, like, these are two cases, and I'm very explicit in the first pattern that I'm patching on the most significant bit and check against zero, one. Again, not terribly complex. All right, now we're done with the bytes and, and bits. <sighs> Let's model the spec itself, the protocol, right? Uh, so what are those records, or think messages? Uh, what's the life cycle of them? Now, any sane person at this point would just go with vanilla racket. Seriously, and if, you, if you're thinking about writing this for production, do that. <laughs> now, I mean, use lists, use hash tables, maybe occasional struct, right? And abstract with procedures. Just do that. Don't do what I did. But don't forget, this is a bit of an exercise, so I have an excuse. Um, there was a failed attempt because I was trying to be clever and learn, a little, learn me a little more racket. I thought, um, you know what? I noticed that racket structs support um, very simple um, inheritance. And I thought I'd use that and leverage generic interfaces. That was a dumb idea. Really big mistake because it was a fault of mine. I sort of brought baggage from other languages where generics and protocols don't work in the same, the delegation doesn't work exactly the same. So that went down in flames, but lesson learned. So having played with some of the basic building blocks uh, that the Racket language provides, it occurred to me that what I was interested in, what I missed the most, would be a sort of a more nimble data structure, um, the kind you reach out for when you're, when you're prototyping, you're sketching, you're thinking in code. So as such, it would have to be um, sort of more ad hoc, uh, and quite a bit more expressive, hopefully, than the racket struct. Um, 
if only because they, they would be used in a, in a very different context. But at the same time, I would want it to be not as ad hoc as, say, a hash table. So at the very minimum, I would want it to have some notion of identity. So if you ask a question, what the hell are you, it would give you a reasonable answer. Um, I happened to be playing with this nifty little language called Lua at the time, and I, I really liked some of the ideas. I hated the syntax, um, but some of the ideas were pretty good. Um, for this particular problem at hand, trying to implement fast CGI, I thought like the prototypes, uh, the, prototype, the prototype inheritance and the prototypes that it, it calls them meta tables, by the way, and tables, um, would work really nicely. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna try and bring those tables to, uh, at least part of the uh, semantics, to Racket and see how it goes. And from now, not, from now on, I'll be talking about meta tables and tables, and not necessarily using the word prototype, but I, I, I would have to assume that you at least know a little bit about prototypes, because otherwise it would take forever. Um, and if you learn about prototypes from JavaScript, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I, I could never make it work, even though I was familiar with JavaScript, the good parts. But I don't know, it, it would never work for me. Um, Lua, this time around, felt much simpler and at least not obviously broken. So that was good. All right, so here, when you look at this code, uh, try to look more at the um, sort of syntactic sugar and figure out the semantics behind it. It's a very prototypical, pun intended, example, right? I took it, I think, straight out of the Lua textbook or something, right? Um, what are tables? Think uh, hash tables, think maps, right? Associative data structure, uh, keys and values, that sort of thing. Um, Although it provides a way of interaction, so like, uh, with meta tables, every table can have a meta table. What's a meta table? It's just a table, yeah. And one of the ideas that fall out from this uh, is like one of those adage, uh, the old quip, right? Uh, almost every computer science problem can be solved with enough levels of interaction. This is one of those. <laughs> I feel like. Um, so what's going on here? Uh, we're going to define a bunch of bank accounts, types of bank accounts, right? So we define an account. By the way, the angle brackets, nothing special. It's just a convention I adopted, right? It's part of the identifier. So we define, a, we define a, an account with a balance of zero, so the key balance is set to zero. But I'm gonna use a table to create more tables. Like, that's a meta table. So think prototype. And I define a bunch of, a bunch of methods. When I say method, all I mean is just procedural value that happens to be on the table. It's just a value, a procedure. Uh, but with a funny syntax, right? So withdraw, deposit, what else? New, the first implementation followed Lua semantics, I no longer do. For in Lua, to implement prototype inheritance, you would have to implement this new kind of thing. And it would be just a couple of lines of code, nothing complex, but that's where the prototype inheritance magic would happen. Uh, we don't have to do that in, in, with tables and racket though. And once you have that, you can derive new types of accounts, like limited account maybe, then you instantiate it, create a table, you deposit some money, you withdraw some money, and maybe you check the balance, that sort of thing, right? And you can keep going. So what sort of syntax stands out? How do you create tables? Uh, curly braces, right? Um, but notice that the entry, the key and the value are wrapped in an extra set of params. Um, I did a bunch of closure. I, I think there's such a thing as too little syntax. And I think closure got it a little too far. Um, that call and call notation, what's up with that? You can probably figure out what's going on. Define cooperates with it, so define is aware of that somehow. Um, what else? What's up with call and balance? Uh, in Racket, that would be an unbound identifier. Somehow that works out, I never bound it. What else? How do you deposit, withdraw? You invoke those methods, right? You invoke those procedures with this column, column notation. You, you, chat, you look up stuff with this column notation. So um, to implement this, you do not need anything beyond what you learned at Racket Summer School. I promise. And you don't even have to hack the reader in Racket. And I, as we go through the slides, I'll try to point out such, uh, such cases, how that would work. So, don't bother reading that code. It's just to show you how little it takes, even with Lua semantics, 
to once you have prototypes to implement something like multiple inheritance. Although that particular example, I found unsatisfactory because it's opaque. Um, what I mean by that, uh, behind the scenes, actually this is a closure that um, dispatches two classes or think meta tables, right? It, since it's a closure, I have no idea what it is. I cannot, I have no way of asking or differentiate it from anything else. And I cannot extend it. I cannot remove meta tables. I cannot add meta tables. It has a problem of identity, so I cannot check what it is. Um, dissatisfied with this, I decided to roll on my own semantics so that everything, stuff like this works. All right, how are we doing for time? I think I have time. So very quickly, remember that column balance notation? Yeah? All right, so I think, I think symbols are a little overloaded in scheme and therefore in racket. Like there is a reason Clojure brought the outer quoted uh, data type keywords and they allow them in, in expression position. I also came to appreciate the decision that racket made with its keywords, disallowing them in expression position. It becomes really handy. Thing is, I don't want to choose. I don't, want, I don't prefer one over the other. So that's why I made this silly little hack I call tags. Behind the scenes, this is just a quoted symbol, nothing else. So Rec at Summer Schools, how would you implement that? Pop quiz. Pop quiz. That's the trick you probably would have seen. Have they seen that? Yeah. All right. Hack the top, yeah, hack the top. All it takes, so you find, remember that unbound identifiers, racket wraps in the top, right? So you can wrap it in datum and get yourself that uh, call notation tags. Um, it's not a rich data type though. Uh, I wish it were. I, by thinking about, uh, while thinking about this, I ran into a limitation in racket language, turns out. So you cannot introduce datum-like forms. Um, if you want to know more about this, uh, Matthew Flatt has an extensive reply on mailing list. Incidentally, if you're looking for a way to contribute to Racket the language, that would make for a really cool project. And I would leverage that. <laughs> and maybe learn from you as well. Okay, let's go back to tables. So in Racket, it's not much of a stretch to say that everything is a struct. Um, tables are no different, and at last I get to use structs as hopefully they were intended to be used. Um, a note on some of the semantics. Like, a uh, table is an associative data structure, so you very quickly ran into this issue of, into the question, how do you signal that something isn't there? If you look up a key, it's not there, what do you do? Do you signal an error? What do you do? I made a design decision, all right? I return an undefined. Undefined values are not allowed on the tables. And the entire infrastructure cooperates to ensure that this, um, invariant holds. I have to remind you at this point though that undefined, the value undefined, is not falsely in racket, right? It's not nil in closure or common lisp or emacs lisp, so be careful, but we provide some operators to sort of bridge to racket and logical expression there. All right, most of, bulk of the semantics actually resides in these three meta methods, but we have more. When I say meta method, all I mean is a procedural value that happens to be on a table that's used as a meta table. That's all I mean. And there are some special, some, some slots or tags that are treated specially by the system, that's all. But you get to override them uh, in any way you like. So for instance, get, um, when present, will decide what semantics to use, what to do when the key is missing on a table. Or a set meta, for instance, it's the when present, it's the final step that, um, that runs in a constructor. Okay, so very quickly, some syntactic conveniences, right? You've already seen constructors, curly braces. We also allow identifiers in the app position. If it's a procedure, the table will be passed to, to that procedure. If it's a table, it will be used as a meta table. There's this uh, weird little uh, notation with keyword check followed by, by a table. Okay, this is a, an experiment of mine to allow traits or mixins right there in the constructor. Comes in handy. Uh, the keyword itself carries no meaning, right? You can use whatever you want for readability. And I'll show you how that's, uh, that works. Uh, yeah, how do you take over curly brace? Again, <laughs> take over the app. That's all it takes to do that. For anything more involved, you'd probably want to take over the reader. Um, we also take the page from the record book and provide indirection. So the constructor expands into intermediate uh, 
form that takes the binding from the call site. So you get to override and implement your own constructor semantics if you want. I thought just uh, it would be curious to do that. Um, how do you query stuff? Okay, this, um, you can, the simplest thing you can do is just get table key and go to town, do whatever you want. But for when it's a procedural value and want to call it, like a method, for instance, implicitly passing the receiver, we also allow this call and call and call notation. Um, so stand alone, th these are just procedures that work right even for keyword arguments if the underlying procedure takes them. Um, how do you implement that? I feel like a one-trick pony by now, right? Hack the top and app. Uh, it's a, I don't know, the, whoever decide to provide those in intermediate forms, stroke of genius. <laughs> uh, we also, again, we provide an indirection with another form we expand into, and you can take this over if you want. Um, define is a drop-in replacement for I could define, and it works correctly for uh, high-order functions and keyword arguments, but it's aware of this call and call notation. The, the difference between the two is call and call uh, implicitly passes the table, the receiver itself, as the, as the first argument. And yeah, match expander, so obviously you can use, uh, how do we provide all of this? Well, originally I had my own little language, but then decided what the heck. Racket with tables, racket base with tables, hash lang, and go to town. If you hate sugar, require it. Whoever came up with multi-collection packages, <laughs> genius. <laughs> that you can do something like this, amazing. All right, very quickly, so, I, examples of some interesting meta tables that uh, I created, but you could too. Um, I promised multiple inheritance, that's all it takes. Yeah, just one method. And it's no longer opaque, uh, you can extend it. You can add meta tables, remove meta tables. Um, uh, we also recover identity with this meta method. Uh, you get to override any and all of this, change the strategy, whatever you want, all right. Another meta table spec has nothing to do with closure spec, maybe superficially. Um, the idea is simple. As you implement a lot of tables in the code and that are to be used as meta tables, it's not a bad idea, if nothing else, for your future self to declare right there in the code what keys or slots can appear there. So that's why I wanted this ad hoc trait syntax. Of course, traits and mixins in the context of tables are nothing special. It's just procedure that takes a table, returns a table, right? Um, so that spec right there, it, the tray, defines the semantics, but it does nothing at all. So it doesn't perform any checks, but we can derive two more uh, meta tables, like open here, from spec, and still a spec. That one will enforce the contracts. So whenever the table gets changed, those predicates will be, will be checked. I ought to leverage contract system and rack it more though for this. I, I, I don't do that yet. And that's kind of, that's completely implemented with it within tables themselves. So that's kind of a hint at what it takes. Okay, something that you have to escape uh, to into racket for now, um, probably forever, I don't know. Um, so I, when I implemented FastAGI, I wanted tables to double as events. You can already call them, so they are procedures. Um, and that's all it takes to, to do that. Um, but you have to derive from, uh, from table struct, right? Uh, incidentally, the sa in the same manner, you can extend generic interfaces to the tables. The entire infrastructure will work uh, correctly with your own derivation, so with your own struct. Um, so you get to use constructors and all of that. That is to say, tables are sort of not just first class, they, they are kind of racket first class. Um, and finally, have I managed to actually build for CGI? <laughs> Well, I'm happy to report that yes, it's probably not the most beautiful production quality code out there, but it's well under 1,000 lines of code, uh, and that includes tests. And in fact, I have been running fast CGI web application this entire time. That clicker right here, um, it's a stupid little web page that talks to my machine, and my fast CGI backend talks to Emacs, drives presentation, <laughs> sends, wait, a, wait for it, it sends the prompt to my iPhone, and that updates the timer with the server time so I know how long I've been talking. Because apparently, even though I'm a dad, I have no life. Okay. So uh, very quickly, stuff I've been working on and um, thinking about, and I hope some of it, at least, will make into my strange loop talk in September. Um, 
uh, I would ask if some uh, people in academia actually, maybe if you, if you know something about this and you can advise me, just come talk to me, all right? So elephant in the room, right? Tables are mutable. I don't think they have to be. Like, um, how do you go immutable without changing the semantics too much? Can you completely do this as within meta tables? Like, implement a meta table immutable and everything that derives from that happens to be immutable? Um, dispatch. Prototype dispatch is already very powerful, but it's a little limited. Can you allow more generic dispatch? Like, separate the, what methods are from tables and meta tables a little bit. And since tables double as procedures, maybe those generic methods can actually be tables. Yeah, and maybe go more ad hoc with multi-methods. But more interestingly, um, so if you, if you ever played with, say, RDF triples or uh, graph databases, maybe semantic web, if you look at tables, what they are is just bags of facts. Once looked in this light, once viewed in this light, you start thinking prolog, data log, that sort of thing, right? Maybe that's the kind of dispatch you want to do, right? Of course, it raises a lot of questions, especially if you allow, if you allow method combinations. How do you choose the most specific one? How do you sort them? Is it by implication? Or, yeah, I don't know the answers to that, but I've been thinking about it. <laughs> It'll probably be dog slow. How do you speed this up? But this is an interesting question to ask, right? Okay, and yeah, if everything becomes kind of a backed by a meta table, uh, we are not far off from that. Meta table protocol with an obvious nod to meta object protocol, except I think in the context of tables, like there's less ceremony than with classes. Maybe protocol is, is a bit of, becomes a bit of a misnomer. Um, once you have, maybe it's worth, once, once everything is backed by the meta table, maybe it's worth thinking about the hierarchy that spans uh, built-in data types, bu built-in racket data types. Turns out, I, I recently discovered that there is an implementation for, of meta object protocol for MZ scheme. I have no idea if it runs at Racket. I like the code, and one of the things that I noticed there, a hierarchy of classes that sort of, that spans Racket built-in data types. So I def I'm definitely not the first uh, person to think of that. And yeah, maybe some more crazy ideas like persistent uh, tables backed by, I don't know, Redis or SQL, something like this. All of this to say, all of that talk, <laughs> I hope that message didn't get lost there, is, that, is to say that Racket is just what you make of it, yeah? Um, look around uh, for ideas in other languages, bring them to Racket. If nothing else, you will learn from that. And I'm gonna leave you with this. And I have no idea if it, I can attribute it to Matt Might, but that's where I heard it. Is, is your quote? <laughs> All right, so Matthias. But I, I explained why I put Matt Might there. Um, I went to a Papers We Love meetup in New York once, and it was Matt Mice's paper that was presented, and he flew in just, just for that. Someone in the audience asks a question, why the hell racket? And that was his response. I didn't know it was you, Matthias. So. But you know the punchline, right? Everyone knows the punchline? Yeah? Who doesn't know the punchline? Okay. Racket is the second best programming language I know. The punchline is that the best programming language, chances are, will be implemented in Racket. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>